Hi everyone, and welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Jessica, I am the director of the Planetarium, and with me tonight as our voice in the sky is one of the students uh, who works at the Planetarium, and I will let him introduce himself. Hi, I'm Luis Cuyo, and I'm a chemical engineering student at UMD. So tonight, we are going to go on an adventure through the universe. Um, in the past, we have done solar system, moons of the solar system, and now we're going to go beyond that and see as much of the universe as we can in about 30 minutes. There's a lot to see. We're not going to see it all, uh, but we're going to try and see as much as we can and some really cool stuff along the way. Now, as we are going uh, on our adventure, if you do have any questions throughout the show, please leave them down in the comments. Louise is going to be keeping an eye on that for me and will let me know as questions come up. Uh, if we can't get to them right away, we will also take time at the end of the show to answer your questions as well. So with that, let me get switched over to our universe. So we are starting out tonight sitting on the Earth, a view that we are pretty familiar with here. We've got the stars up in the sky. Those stars, of course, to many people make different patterns and shapes that we call our constellations. There have been a lot of different constellations among different cultures, a lot of different stories told with these stars. Um, and we're not going to go over those tonight because we have a whole other show all about that. But some of the other things that we can see up in our sky, of course, are the moon when it's visible, some of the planets we can see up. But we, thankfully, with this amazing program are not bound to the surface of the earth like we are. Uh, and so we are able to actually venture up and out and away, up into orbit around the earth. And for anyone interested, um, the program that we are using to do this universe tour tonight is a program called Open Space. Um, it is actually a free universe uh, program to explore the universe using data taken by astronomers. Um, but it is a very big, beefy program and takes a pretty powerful computer to run. Um, so not everyone, unfortunately, would be able to run it from your own computer. All right, we are now up in orbit around our beautiful blue marble Earth. That blue, of course, being our water that makes our home very special as we are the only planet in our solar system to have uh, liquid surface water. And of course, we are not the only planet in our solar system. Let me go ahead. See if that's going to work. Activate. Sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once here. Okay. Luis, did the poll go up? Yeah, there it is. All right, so on our journey through the universe, we are going to stop by a few planets. Because, I mean, our planets are a part of our universe. Um, but we aren't going to spend time looking at all of them. Uh, so let us know with the poll which terrestrial, that's the inner planet, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, you would like for us to go see. And I'm seeing about a 50-50 split between Mercury and Mars. So you know what? Let's just do both. What do you say? We'll go and see both. All right. So we will start off with Mercury, the closest planet to the sun.
I'm flying on in to Mercury. If you keep seeing me look to the side, I'm looking at my other screen where I'm seeing what you're seeing with our, our tour of the, the universe. All right, so here is little Mercury. It looks maybe a little familiar. Um, a lot of people say that it looks like our moon. And there's good reason for that. Uh, our moon and the planet Mercury are very similar objects. They're both big balls of rock in space. Uh, and they've both been hit over and over and over again by objects creating these craters. And we can find craters all over the surface. Different sizes different places showing us that Mercury has been hit a lot and by a lot of different sized objects. And that's pretty typical. We see that among every object in our solar system. We also find Mercury is of course incredibly hot since it's the closest planet to the sun. Daytime temperatures can get up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit, five, 600, you know, no big deal, right? Um, but nighttime temperatures, on the other hand, can plummet down to negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's because there's no atmosphere to trap the daytime heat during the night. And that means the night cools off incredibly fast and stays cold. All right, so the other terrestrial planet that people wanted to go see is Mars. So let's go take a look at Mars. And as we are adventuring through Mars, go ahead and with the poll, let me know which outer planet we should go see after we're done taking a look at, at uh, Mars. All right, so this is Mars. It is nicknamed the Red Planet for good reason. We can see it is very red in color. And that comes from uh, actually rust, iron oxide, that sits all over the surface, giving it this rusty red appearance. A couple of really cool things on Mars that I want to point out uh, are not on the daytime. So I'm going to use a little bit of planetary magic here. We're going to speed up time. So that we can bring those features into the daylight. Where's, I think that's down here. Did I go too far? I might have gone too far. Nope, didn't go far enough. There we go. All right, so the first thing to point out is this big, almost what looks like a pimple on Mars. And this is Olympus Mons, the largest volcano, not just on Mars, but in our solar system. So big that if you were to set it on Earth, it would cover up the entire state of Arizona and sits about three times taller than Mount Everest, an absolutely massive volcano. And then nearby, we have a few other volcanoes. Now, all of the volcanoes on Mars are currently dormant. Uh, they are no longer active. But given the size, we can see that they were active for a long, long time, which allowed them to build up to such a big size. And the other really interesting feature here is this big gash which is a canyon system known as Valles Marineris. Kind of makes me want spaghetti after saying that. Um, but this is a canyon not unlike our Grand Canyon. It's just, well, grander. Because this canyon would stretch across the entire United States. And in some places is four times deeper than our Grand Canyon. So truly a grand canyon on Mars, stretching about a fifth of the way across the surface of Mars. 
All right. Looks like we have a question. Awesome. Yeah, the, our question is, when was the last time Earth was hit by an asteroid? Ooh, so... Good question. <laughs> it is a good question. Earth gets hit by objects literally every day. Um, now, whether you would call them an asteroid, uh, it's kind of a fuzzy line between what's an asteroid and what's just a small chunk of rock in space. Um, most people will call all of those things asteroids. Um, so literally, we get hit by small pieces of rock every single day. Um, the thing is, most of Earth is uninhabited, right? We have 75% of the surface is covered in water, and a good portion of the land area is uninhabited. So most of those things hit where there's no one. Uh, and so they go unnoticed. But yeah, we we get hit by, by small things all the time. Um, I think the last bigger object was the um, fireball that or the, the um, object that exploded over Russia in 2014. Um, I think that was the last uh, kind of slightly larger. Um, now, if we want to talk truly enormous, like, uh, what's the word? Mass extinction objects, that would be 65 million years ago with the asteroid that hit and led to the demise of the dinosaurs. Oh, wow. We have such an even split for the outer planets. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll quickly do, we'll quickly do Jupiter and Saturn and swing by Neptune. And hi, mom. I see your call for Pluto. I love you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> All right. Well, let's go do this so we have enough time to venture elsewhere as well. So let's head to Jupiter real quick. The king of the planet, since it is the largest planet in our solar system. As we're flying in, all of those lines you're seeing are moons. Jupiter has 79 moons around it. And as There's we get in, go ahead. Oh, there's another question since we were just talking about on Mars too, is how did the Canaan systems form? Ah, good question. So that's still kind of an active area, but we think um, with some new evidence that it may actually be a giant fault line. Uh, we in the past thought that Mars didn't have plate tectonics like we have here on Earth, but new evidence is suggesting there might actually be two big plates, one in the northern hemisphere and one in the south, and that canyon system could be at the fault line where those two plates meet. Um, and then once the crack started, you have just millions and millions of years of wind and erosion and things like that um, that caused it to get truly giant in scale. All right. So Jupiter is one of my, I say, I love looking at Jupiter with these beautiful swirls of clouds, um, the different colored cloud bands, we can see little storms in the little kind of like ovals that we see. But the iconic feature of Jupiter is, of course, the Great Red Spot, which is literally a big red spot on Jupiter. We, we are not clever with names as astronomers. Um, but this is actually a hurricane, but not really like a hurricane on Earth. So this is a high pressure system hurricane. Uh, whereas hurricanes on Earth are low-pressure systems. This hurricane could also fit three Earths inside it and has been going on for over 350 years. Truly impressive. Um, we don't know why it has lasted for so long, but as long as we have been able to observe Jupiter through a telescope, which started back in the 1600s with Galileo, we have seen the storm and it has been there. Um, so yeah, lots, lots to still learn with Jupiter. All right. Next up real quick is Saturn, which is typically a crowd favorite. As we fly in, we see lots of moons as well. Jupiter or Saturn actually has more moons than Jupiter having 82. And 
And of course, it is known for its big, beautiful ring system, even though it's not the only planet to have rings. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all have rings. It's just Saturn's are the biggest and the brightest, so they are the ones most easily seen from Earth. So they are the first discovered, and it's the most well-known system. Um, then we'll fly past, I think the other tie was Neptune. The outermost planet, which has this really pretty royal blue color that comes from actually methane in its atmosphere, creates that very pretty blue color. And then in addition to planets, our solar system also has dwarf planets, uh, the biggest of which is Pluto. Um, now, this category of dwarf planets came about in the early 2000s because we started finding lots of things like Pluto. And astronomers had to make the decision of, are all of these objects going to be planets, or do we come up with a new category for the Pluto-like objects? And that's what they did. And that's where that dwarf planet category uh, came from. And so Pluto is the largest of the dwarf planets, and there are four others, Haumea, Makimaki, Eris, and Ceres. And of course, iconic to Pluto is that wonderful heart known as Tombaugh Regio, which is named after Clyde Tombaugh, who discovered Pluto. All right. So let's refocus on our sun as we start to head out of our solar system now. We do have two more questions okay. <laughs> pertaining to our solar system here. The first one is, uh, do the gas pl planets have uh, rocky cores or are they 100% gas? Good question. So the term gas planet is actually a misnomer. They are not primarily gas. They are actually mostly liquid hydrogen. So they'd be better called liquid giants, but they do also have, we think, a rocky core as well. Um, that at those temperatures and pressures is probably a liquid rocky core. Um, that's actually one of the things we're still trying to better understand is the internal structure. Um, but yeah, gas giant, it's a misnomer. They're not mostly gas. They're mostly liquid hydrogen. Yes, and then our second question is, how were the ring, or Saturn's rings formed? So all ring systems are due to an object that gets too close to the planet and gets ripped apart by the planet's gravity. So we think Saturns are as big and bright as they are because in the past uh, 500 million years or so, a comet actually got too close and got ripped apart. And that's what's created all of the icy particles that have enhanced and really grew Saturn's ring system. So that's another really good question. All right. So as we are flying out and away from our solar system, I want to quickly turn our constellations back on because even out here on the outskirts of our solar system, we can see that the constellations look the same. And that comes down to the fact that the stars are even further away than the most outermost planet. And we have to travel about four light years away from our sun before we reach the nearest star and enter the realm of the stars. And once we do so, then we start to see those constellation shapes twist and warp. And what we're seeing is these stars that we think of as close together in constellations in 3D space really aren't actually near each other. They just appear to be right next to each other because of how we are seeing them along our line of sight from here on Earth. All right. So as we are venturing out, we can now start to find lots of other things. Um, first is, well, we're not the only planetary system out there. 
every star that is currently circled right now is another planetary system, another star with at least one planet around it. We have found thousands and thousands of planets just around the closest stars to us. And based off of what we found, we think that at least half of all stars in our galaxy have a planet. And with a galaxy of 100 billion stars, that means we have 50 billion planets out there. Uh, it's truly mind-boggling when we start thinking about the numbers of other things that are out there. Now, speaking of those stars, uh, stars will often form in groups that we call star clusters. Um, those star clusters come in a few different types. We have what are known as open clusters, and those are being highlighted in green right now. And the kind of quintessential example of an open cluster is the Pleiades star cluster that we can actually see right now up in the nighttime sky. It's in the constellation of Taurus the Bull, looks kind of like a little mini dipper. Um, and Pleiades, like other open clusters, are groups of hundreds to thousands of stars that um, all were born from the same gas cloud and formed kind of get together, but they're a kind of looser, more spread out group of stars. Um, you'll also find that there is usually a really pretty blue glow associated with open clusters. And that's because we're seeing the light from big, hot blue stars that are common to find in young star systems. Um, the other type of star cluster that we can have is a globular cluster. And those are being highlighted now in yellow. Let me swing around so that we can see where those guys are. So globular clusters are named because they, well, really look like a big glob of stars, honestly. Um, they are a roughly spherical concentration of tens to hundreds of thousands of stars that are tightly bound together in this globular cluster. You can see that they're more densely concentrated at the center, and um, we kind of see it becomes less or more and more sparse as we move outward from the center. Um, and we don't see that pretty blue glow, and that's because these are older populations of stars. And so those blue stars that we see in Pleiades have already died, and so we don't see them anymore. We only see the stars that are still alive, which are mostly yellow-red stars, and that's where that kind of yellow-red color comes from. All right. So... Uh, as we continue to move out, not only do we find stars and planets in our galaxy, but we also find big clouds of gas that are called nebulas. And those nebulas come in a few different types. Uh, the first, let me, there it is, are what we call star forming regions. And they are highlighted in blue right now. You can see they're really concentrated in the kind of plane of the Milky Way, because that's where most of the big gas clouds live. And an example is the Orion Nebula, which is found in the Sword of Orion and is also up right now in the winter. So these are called star forming regions because these are literally giant gas clouds where stars are born. Um, so these gas clouds contain hundreds to thousands of masses worth, uh, or solar masses, stars masses worth, of gas and can create these clusters that we have just seen. And within the Orion Nebula, we do see young little protostars that are currently forming and being born, um, which is just really cool. Now, our other type, or our two other types of gas clouds of nebulae, um, instead of being associated with the birth of stars, are actually associated with the death of stars. And so one of those is what we call a planetary nebula. And it looks like this. 
The name Planetary Nebula is a little bit of a misnomer because um, it doesn't actually have anything to do with planets. Um, but this is what happens to lower mass stars, stars like our sun. As they reach the end of their lives, the outer layers puff up and as those outer layers move further and further out, the star loses its hold on it, and that gas just floats outward. And so over time, we end up with this shell of gas that was once part of the star that's now moving outward, and what's left behind at the center is what we call a white dwarf. That's just the dead core of the star that's still super hot, but is slowly going to cool over time, just like a coal or an ember. And so this is what's going to happen to our sun in about 5 billion years. So we've got a while there. But more massive stars go through a much more dramatic end to their life. And instead of gently puffing up and floating away, uh, the star actually explodes in a supernova. And what ends up being left behind is a supernova remnant. And a good example of one of those is the Crab Nebula. Now, what's really cool about the Crab Nebula, this supernova remnant, is people on Earth did actually see the supernova that created this supernova remnant. The supernova happened back in, I believe it was 1055. Um, I am checking my notes real quick. 1054, that was close. Um, Chinese astronomers in the year 1054 noted that there was a sudden guest star that appeared um, and then slowly faded over several months. And based off of the star charts that they made, the, where it was in the sky, that matches up with where the supernova remnant is. And the age of the supernova remnant matches that date of 1054. Um, so people on Earth saw the supernova that created this, which is really cool. All right. So let's continue moving out through our galaxy. So that we can see our galaxy as a whole. And just for fun, let me show you those constellation lines again. So remember, those constellation lines are showing us the stars that are visible in our night sky, which we can now see is a very, very small portion of our Milky Way galaxy. We're only seeing the closest thousand, several thousand stars in our galaxy. Remember, there are 100 billion stars in our galaxy. So there's a lot that we can't see just because it's too far away for us to see it. So our galaxy is a classic, what we call spiral disk galaxy, because it's disk shaped. You can see that as I kind of go edge on and back around, kind of like a frisbee. And of course, it has this really pretty spiral arm structure to it, which is how it gets the spiral disk galaxy name. Uh, the center of our galaxy is slightly elongated into what we call a bar. Not not that kind of bar. Um, so we live in a barred spiral galaxy. And sitting at the very center is a supermassive black hole uh, that we call Sagittarius A star. Uh, and it turns out that we are not alone. Most, if not all, galaxies have a supermassive black hole at their center. All right. Um, so as we fly out, uh, we can see that we are not the only galaxy out here. So what we're seeing now are little green points to represent other galaxies and some other images as well for some other galaxies that are within what we call our local group of galaxies. We have about 60 to 70 galaxies in our local group. Milky Way, the Milky Way, our galaxy is the second largest of those the largest being the Andromeda Galaxy. 
Most of the galaxies, though, in our local group are small dwarf galaxies, which is why they're just little data points, because they you can't really see them that well. And we don't have good pictures of them. But even then, our local group of galaxies are not alone. As we continue to go outward, we now see more and more points of light, each of which is another galaxy. And we'll keep flying outward where we will see oops, more and more and more and more galaxies as I turn on all of the different galaxies that are visible. Every point of light is a galaxy. And we're going to keep going out. Um, now you may see that there are these kind of blank spaces, kind of top left and bottom right. That's not because there aren't galaxies there. That's because we can't see that region of space because our own galaxy blocks our view. Um, so we think it looks very similar to everything else we see. We just can't directly image it or map it because our galaxy blocks our view. But we'll keep going out, and there's even more galaxies, until we reach the very edge of our observable universe, which is the cosmic microwave background. Um, now this is the edge of our observable universe for two reasons. One, light takes time to travel. It's not instantaneous, it has a speed. Um, the second thing is our universe is not infinitely old. It is a set age. It's about 14 billion years old. So because of that, light has only had 14 billion years to travel from point A to point B. That means the furthest we could see away is 14 billion light years. Anything past that could exist, could be there, light just hasn't had time to reach us. And so that's why it's a limit on our observable universe, what we can currently see. But as time continues to pass, that grows bigger and bigger and bigger. And we will be able to see further and further out. But let's now fly away back in. in. Back through all those galaxies. Back to our Milky Way. Let me turn off these galaxies so they stop obscuring our view. And back home to our sun. And our solar system. And with that, we have done a very quick, brief tour of our universe and some of the many, many things that exist in it. Um, so yeah, do we have any other questions that came up, Luis? Uh, no, it doesn't look like it. All right, well, if you do have any other questions, now is a great time to leave them down in the comments, uh, and I can try and answer those for you. Um, and while we wait and see if any more questions come in, let me tell you what you can expect over the next week. So on Saturday, we are going to be doing our show, How Do We Know?, uh, that Eli has put together, and he's going to teach us how we know things that we typically think of as just fact, like the speed of light, 
how do we know that? How do we know what it is? He's going to tell us how early scientists figured that out. Then next week, we are in the first week of February already. I can't believe it. So we will be doing our beginning of month shows of What's Up uh, February edition on next Wednesday and February Constellation Storytime next Saturday. Uh, now, if you are interested in having one of these uh, for your own little group, we do offer private virtual shows as well as virtual field trips for K through 12. You can find more information about that on our website. And if you love what we do and want to help support us, we are still selling our stellar distancing t-shirts to help raise money since we have been closed since mid-March. It's been almost a year and that hurts every time I think about that. All right. Looks like we have some questions. Awesome. Uh, the first one is how are stars formed within the nebula? Ooh, good question. So the short answer is gravity. Um, but the longer answer is in these gas clouds, there are areas that are a little bit denser and that allows gravity to pull in that gas closer and tighter and it keeps pulling on that little clump of gas pulling it denser and denser and denser tighter and tighter um, into a smaller and smaller ball of gas and that will continue until it reaches the temperature needed for hydrogen to fuse into helium and that's when we technically call something a star once hydrogen fusion starts it's a star um, so that's the very short version of how we go from gas cloud to star. We're going to have another another short one or another long answer that's going to be short and is what is a black hole and how do they form? Ooh, other good question. So a black hole is basically a region in space where the mass of an object has been compacted so tightly into such a small area that its gravity is stronger than light, meaning nothing can escape from its gravitational pull, not even light itself. And that's why we call it a black hole. Um, it's not really a hole, uh, but it is black because light can escape it. So nothing, there's, there's no light shining or anything. Um, now, they form from the deaths of the most massive stars. So we're talking 25 times the mass of our sun or bigger. Um, they are so big that the when they go supernova, the central region of the star um, collapses in on itself and there's nothing to stop that collapse. It's so big and heavy, and it just collapses down into this really dense object that we call a black hole. Um, I hope that makes sense. It's, it's difficult to explain this um, in, in a shorter time period, but that's that's the, the basics of it. Uh, I like this next question we have. Uh, are there any, have there ever been any identified minerals in asteroids that have hit Earth? Hmm. Anything that's not known? Not that I can think of, but I do know the compositions of some meteorites have shown us that they actually came from Mars. Um, so we have some meteorites that are actually chunks of Mars. Um, we also have some meteorites that are chunks of the moon. Um, so, yeah, I can't think of anything that has hit that had something that's unidentified within it. Um, but yeah, we have been able to trace some of them to some maybe unexpected locations. And then the final question we have for tonight is what kind of tools are used to see outside of our galaxy? If it's just um, strong telescopes or special telescopes? Pretty much just a really big telescope. Um, you can actually see another galaxy just with your eyes. Uh, in the fall, the Andromeda galaxy is visible to the northern hemisphere. And it is bright enough that you can see it with your eye. You don't need a telescope. Um, if you have a telescope, you can start to see other galaxies as well, even with just a small, like, four-inch, six-inch telescope. 
Um, but of course, research observatories use much, much, much larger telescopes, which allow us to see things that are even fainter and even further away. Uh, and that's how we've been able to map out so many galaxies and see so many out there. It's a really good, some really good questions tonight. Definitely have. Yeah, just a thank you. Of course, right. thank you for tuning in. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you everyone so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, definitely check out our future events. Um, we've got some special stuff coming up in February as well um, with Valentine's Day and uh, the landing of the Perseverance rover on Mars. So just tune in, uh, you know, keep an eye out on our Facebook page. We'll announce um, those shows as well. Um, and yeah, I think that's it for the night. So again, thank you. Um, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening and we will see you next time. Bye everyone.